Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our KBMO webinar on uh, the structure and function of the gastrointestinal system. Um, that's not a very good start, I can't say it. Um, we're joined by Lucy Peel from Biomedica, um, who is the UK and EU practitioner support. Um, I won't spend too long introducing you, uh, Lucy. I I'll, I'll, will be handing over to you nice um, and quickly because I know that we, um, we only have an hour, so we've got to get through your fabulous presentation and then we'll have time for questions as well. Um, really, um, we decided to partner with Lucy for this webinar because we've just launched our uh, gut barrier panel as part of the FIT 132 and FIT 176. If you go to our website, kbmodiagnostics.co.uk, we have got some uh, materials on there to explain what it's all about. Um, and we can talk about that at the end um, if you do have any questions. It doesn't really change anything in terms of what you order because it is now automatically included with both panels and it is available as a standalone panel now. So you can have the gut barrier panel, which is Candida, Zonulin, Occludin and IgA. So it's a really nice add-on and it's a really good price point as well. Um, anyway, I'm going to hand over straight to Lucy. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A. Um, we can get to those at the end of Lucy's presentation. Um, any burning questions or any of the comments, just pop them in the chat or the Q&A and I'll, I'll deal with those um, quietly in the background so as not to distract um, Lucy. So anyway, Lucy, I'll hand over to you. I'm going to mute and turn my camera off and um, I'll catch up with you at the end. Very much. And yeah, do interrupt me if you need to. That's fine. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, for those of you that I know, it's lovely to have you here. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to just hide my face because that's the only one I can see now, which isn't. Yeah, that's better. Um, so, yeah, so I work for Biomedica, which is an Australian nutraceuticals company. Um, and I, I sort of represent them in the UK. So if you have any questions about their products, um, anything at all, please do get in touch. My email is lucy at biomedica dot uk dot com which looks slightly wrong but i promise you that is the right way around um but please feel free to get in touch hopefully today um as you've met me you'll realize i am quite easy to get in touch with i'm not a scary person and um, will answer any question so yeah charlotte and i really we talked about a few things about um what we sort of see quite a lot when we're doing our practitioner support role and so a lot of this is just a lot of revision because I think you know we all graduate we go to lots of CPD and it's the latest this the latest that and it's all very exciting but it can be quite overwhelming so it kind of detracts a bit from how our system works and how we want to support that um, so we're just kind of kind of come back to a bit more of a naturopathic way of thinking about all of these juices that we make and supporting those juices and what they actually do um, so why is that not moving Oh, there it is. So today we're first going to focus on the stomach and the liver and the pancreas and think about what they do and symptoms where uh, they're not quite working properly, you know, what you're listening out for in your clinic. Um, and then next time, we're really going to focus in on supporting the health of the gut lining and repairing that along along with um, these new panels, obviously, but also the secretions of the gut lining. I'm going to talk a little bit about brush border enzymes today, but next time we're going to be thinking about mucin and secretory IgA and that being part of that picture with um, supporting the integrity of the gut lining as well. So just to remind you, so you can kind of relax a little bit because this isn't like all new stuff, it's it's a bit of revision. Um, I really love this. I use this quite a lot in clinic actually, just because it's very clear and simple. Um, and I took that image years ago from something called Fact Monster, God knows what that was. But um, yeah, just a reminder really that uh, digestion starts uh, when you are looking at your food, thinking about your food, preparing your food, um, you know, that is that is the the emotional aspect um, and looking forward to it is going to actually start to get the digestive juices going as well as um, smelling it. And honestly, it even makes my mouth water just talking about that. Um, but um, but yeah, so once you've got the food into your mouth, chewing it up, mixing it with the saliva, as we all know, it's amylase. 
um, in there as well, helping to kind of start break down the sugars and perhaps keep the teeth clean. And then we swallow that down after we've all chewed 20 times because we're good nutritional therapists into our stomach. And then we have our stomach acid and other juices starting to get the digestion going. That food sits there for a bit and then it's squeegeed out into the small intestine where the juices from the pancreas and the bile duct also squeegee into that small intestine and start to break that um, food down even further. Obviously, we're going to go into that in detail. And um, yeah, then we start to absorb most of our food in the uh, in the small intestine and a little in the large intestine as well. And obviously a bit in the stomach, as you all know. So this is this is what we're seeing in our clinic all the time, isn't it? So these are symptoms that there is something wrong and we're going to kind of dive into this a little bit more um, in different sections with the stomach and the, um, the liver and the pancreas. But yeah, everything from farting, bloating, belching, loose stool, um, loose stool with like kind of food in it, um, uh, fatty stool, bad breath, feeling sick, tummy ache, um, all of these sorts of things. And most importantly, obviously for today, food allergies and intolerances um, are all because that digestive system its function is not working properly. So that's what we really wanna think about today is, is how we support those juices, what actually is digestive function. Um, this is taken from this wonderful book, actually the little, oh, let me just, what's her name again? Lipsky, isn't it? Um, sorry, that bit of the screen is blocked by the, uh, Oh, let's move that over there. There we are. Um, yeah, digestive wellness. If you haven't got this book, I highly recommend it for your clinic, um, especially if you're newer in practice. It's a really great resource. And I've just taken this, um, redrawn this from her book because again, when someone is coming into clinic, I actually, I actually have this as a as a handout. So I'm happy to send it to you, um, just to show people, you know, if they're coming in with some of these symptoms what the causes might be, particularly once you've taken some of that case history and, um, you know, maybe they drink a lot, maybe uh, they've been to McDonald's in a room, as I just mentioned, um, you know, there's, there's uh, not moving around enough, not eating enough fiber. They might be on medication, which is really tricky, as some of you know, especially if they're on PPIs, which they have to be on to negate the effects of, of the medication they're taking. And, and that's a lot of working around something low stomach acid we're going to go into in a, in a little bit and obviously stress um now something that she doesn't mention on here which is uh, quite close to my heart is our posture so um sitting here in front of our computer somebody you, some of you might be eating um if you are sitting hunched forward um when you're eating maybe watching the telly um, I want you just to kind of be aware of this, this angle of compression here. And you have this point in the middle called the axis of hypochondria. And as you can see, that is like really where the stomach is. Yeah. So you get this pressure on the stomach, this pressure um, on, the, on the diaphragm. And when we think about this posture here, and we go back up to this lovely image of the gut, um, think about if this diaphragm here is being um, compressed so I'm just kind of going around that with the mouse there so what we tend to think about um, is what the diaphragm does and what happens above so obviously when you breathe in the diaphragm um, flattens because the lungs are expand it, it pulls the air down into the lungs um, for them to expand and for you to breathe in, obviously. Now, think about what's going on underneath the diaphragm as well as on top of the diaphragm, because when that diaphragm is flattening down in the way it's supposed to, it's massaging all of those internal organs. Now, particularly, let's look at what is going on where the diaphragm is. You have got these flexor pieces of the large intestine so where the ascending colon kind of flexes around here um, where my mouse is sort of at the bottom of the lobe of the liver there and then you've got the transverse colon and then it flexes around here again at the side and you've got the sort of spleen and the stomach and bits and pieces there so quite often that can all get quite congested if somebody is sitting like this all day um, and you will find if you get them to like lie down on a massage bed, if you've got one in your therapy room and you get them to get some nice breaths in and out of their belly, they might start 
making gurgling sounds with their tummy because actually that stomach, that whole abdominal cavity is just so relieved um, to be actually kind of moving and stretching properly. So yeah, please think about that as an aspect of digestion as well as everything else we're talking about today is your posture. Um, also thinking about today, the, uh, the gut brain axis. So again, um, I sort of mentioned it already when, when we're looking at our food or if we're stressed, there, there is going to be a huge influence on the motility of the gut, the secretion of the, uh, the juices in the gut, uh, absorbing the nutrients. And also, um, as we do know, there is a, um, a microbial gut brain um, axis. And if there's dysbiosis in the gut, that's gonna affect the brain. And if we're stressed, that's also gonna affect the, uh, the microbiome as well. Um, so yeah, so just a little reminder there of the gut brain axis. So let's start with the stomach then. Um, and obviously I'm not giving a master's level talk on this. So we're just gonna focus on a few of the things um, that are produced in the stomach, including, um, well, mainly just the hydrochloric acid really, but it also does uh, produce intrinsic factor and uh, pepsinogen. And when the, hydro, the hydrochloric acid combines with the pepsinogen in the stomach, it creates pepsin, which is obviously going to help the, uh, the breakdown of the proteins in the gut. So the hydrochloric acid, yes, starts to denature those proteins for us, um, and it's needed to make the pepsin as well. So it's, you know, it's got double bubble job. Um, and the stronger the stomach acid, the more the pepsin activity um, is going to be uh, increased. So yeah, the optimum pH in the stomach is 1.8 to 3.2, so a nice acidic stomach. And actually we don't reach that uh, optimum pH until we're about two. And it does start to decline, um, as, as I put here, more than half of people over 60 will have low gastric acidity. Now in your clinic, <laughs> most of your over 60s are going to have that because that's why they come to you, you know, and actually the, the low stomach acid has caused all sorts of other problems. They've been on PPIs for years, you know, all of the things that have happened to get them in your clinic, you're more likely to see a higher percentage um, than the average person on the street with this low gastric acidity. And obviously, uh, really important to mention that uh, the stomach acid actually helps maintain that uh, the healthy balance of the microbiome in the small intestine. So again, if we can <clears throat> focus more on the juices uh, in the system, supporting uh, its own system, as it were, and supporting the flora there, rather than going in heavy handed with lots of things, it's, it's a kind of nicer way to do things. So lots of signs as low as stomach acid that you'll see in your clinic. Um, and I think quite key is things like the symptoms immediately after eating, like bloating, burping, a burning feeling, farting straight after a meal, um, feeling really full, not really kind of feeling hungry after a few bites of food and feeling like it's just sitting there in their stomach. Um, I've just I've just got a new client like this actually literally in the last week and it, people tell you that straight away it's just sitting there I don't feel like it's going anywhere or anything's happening with it. Um, indigestion obviously, multiple food allergies, uh, massive sign of, of low stomach acid, feeling sick after the supplements you've given them, um, they might not have been quite ready yet. Um, and also itching around the anus. There are massively long lists you can find. Um, but again, I do recommend that Lipsky Digestive Wellness for, for these sorts of lists. Um, it's a really useful resource as, as a practitioner. So let's think about um, going back to that food allergens I just mentioned. Why? Um, no, sorry, let me start that sentence again. Um, so yeah, so low stomach acid causes poor protein digestion, which increases food um, allergenicity. Um, and so I've just pulled out these uh, two interesting facts, I thought, from this paper, um, Interest Mayer um, and Jensen Jaralim, um, because one study they talk about was basically they they use stimulated gastric fluid um, and found that the allergens from fish 
were less capable of binding to IgE um, by up to 10,000 fold. And also they lost their histamine releasing capacity. So I thought that was really interesting from that point of view when you're seeing somebody coming in with lots of histamine reactions to foods, think about that stomach acid because actually is it that you know their the histamine release capacity could be uh, reduced by you improving that stomach acid? And um, yeah, another study they talked about was um, a group of people that have been on PPIs um, and that they found five months afterwards that they were sensitive towards a lot of things that they usually eat in their in their daily diet. So they develop sensitivities after being on PPIs. And that's really key for us because we see this a lot in our clinics. Um, so I thought that was quite a helpful um, piece of intel there. So yeah, lots of conditions are associated with low stomach acid, a lot of autoimmune um, conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. And um, I think just a, a really important point is that uh, H. pylori can cause low stomach acid. So you've just got to keep an eye out when you're taking your case history for other red flag signs and symptoms. Um, burning pain below the sternum, feeling sick and being sick, um, bloating, often bloating on an empty stomach actually, um, but this pain on an empty stomach is a really obvious one, um, which is improved by eating. That is like a key one. And, and I've definitely seen that in clinic and, and referred back to the doctor and, and they've tested positive for H. pylori. So, you know, it does happen. You will see it in clinic. Um, and uh, it is really useful just to, just to have that in the back of your mind. Um, this as well, the low stomach acid is very easy when people come into us and say, I've got massively high stomach acid. They usually have been on PPIs for a really long time. And it's actually, they've got to the point, they've now got very, very low stomach acid. Um, and the clue there is they're just not digesting fatty meals now, they're feeling really full. So it might've been 10 years ago when they went on that PPI that they might've fed. Um, acid reflux or high stomach acid but now they're actually coming to you like this and some of it is a bit about delicately explaining to them what's going on because it's if you've got your mindset a certain way um, you saying to them you're going to help them with their low stomach acid is really frightening for them so you've got to you know get them feeling comfortable and confident in you and there are ways to to support them um, in that way and, and um, I'll, I'll talk about a product in a minute but also you know, you can use me as, as a practitioner support for that. So supporting stomach acid, the number one thing is the stress management and the gut brain axis and getting those juices going, thinking about that blood flow to the stomach as well. Think about their posture as well as when and how they're eating. Um, particularly, you have to be quite bossy, as you all know, with certain types of clients who are eating at their desk, a rush sandwich. You know, they just can't eat like that if they've got um, problems with low stomach acid. They've got to be chewing their food properly. Um, for some people, uh, bitters or apple cider vinegar, it, that might be too much for some people at the beginning. Um, but actually, uh, we have a formula called IB Pro, which has got chamomile, lemon balm, globe artichoke, caraway and fennel, which actually slightly more gently stimulates the digestive juices um, so you know that might the global artichoke is a bitter but it's it's slightly milder than some of those uh, stronger ones so that might be a gentler place to start with somebody um, and yeah most of you know that uh, you need uh, things like zinc um, to to help create these healthy gut secretions and if you are trying to support the stomach secretions along with safely reducing the PPIs um, again, uh, there are various things you can use to kind of soothe things. So deglycerized licorice, meadow sweet and zinc. Um, we have that in a combination called peptease. Um, and again, I'm very happy to talk you through that, walk you through that. So that's the stomach done for, for now. Um, we're going to move on to the pancreas. And as we all know, um, the pancreas uh, does also secrete um, uh, 
other things that, that go on in the body like insulin, but we're just going to focus on what it's secreting into the gut today, um, which is the digestive enzymes to help us break down the fats, the carbohydrates and the proteins in our food, and also secretes the bicarbonate to neutralize the stomach acid in the duodenum. So you're changing to so the pH is, is increasing at this point. And we'll look at that because actually some of those enzymes work in a, in, a, in a higher pH. We already looked at the pH of the stomach. So we'll look at that in a minute. So if the pancreas isn't working, again, there's going to be bloating going on. There's going to be food sensitivities. There's going to be undigested food in the store because it's not being broken down properly. And they're probably going to feel pretty tired as well. Um, it's pretty common if someone's coming in um, with something like um, psoriasis. Also, as we get older, um, again, the juices um, don't flow so well. Um, IBD and um, obviously stress um, is, you know, uh, as, as we all say to our clients, when you're stressed, it's a primal response and your body does not need to be digesting while you are in that fight or flight mode. So all of these juices get switched off. And so you cannot possibly digest your food when you're feeling stressed. Um, and that goes for watching something stressful on the telly as well, if they're, if they're watching um, telly while they're eating, um, thinking about what they're putting in their mouth while they're feeling stressed or frightened. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you've got to think about that as well. So the most obvious one uh, that we look out for with the pancreas is fatty stools. Um, so that is kind of like greasy stools that they've got to scrub off the loo, um, maybe it's like slightly floating stools. They might be a little bit gray as well. Um, obviously, if they are like that, it's, it's often worth sending them back to the doctor for a little check. There might be a little blockage in that in that pipe that goes from the pancreas into the digestive system. Um, but we want to think about the fact as well that if the stool is fatty, they are not going to be absorbing their fat soluble vitamins so well. Um, so, you know, we've got to think about that knock on effect of, of absorption and assimilation of nutrients. So in the pancreas, the most obvious um, examples, obviously there's more, but we're just uh, <laughs> keeping it short and sweet today. So we've got the, uh, the proteolytic enzymes, which are our proteases, which break down protein. Um, we're going to talk about that in relation to allergies in a minute. Uh, we've got our amylase, which breaks down carbohydrate into simple sugars. I'm also going to talk about that, getting you to consider that in context of um, uh, gluten, people thinking they have a gluten issue. Um, and lipase uh, helps the bile, which we'll talk about in a minute, to break down our fats. On the brush borders, uh, we've got, um, among other things, lactase to help break down milk sugars and glucoamylase, which also helps break down starches. So let's just dive into lactose intolerance. And again, I'm sure you all know this, but just in case you don't, um, it's very, very important to understand that there's two types of lactose intolerance. One is a primary lactose intolerance, which is actually a genetic uh, intolerance. And this usually develops over time. So as babies and young children, we have the lactase enzyme in our gut to help us digest, digest the milk sugars from our mother's milk. And as we grow older, obviously we don't need those enzymes anymore because we've been weaned. And so um, you lose the tolerance for those milk sugars. And so um, as again, most of you know, because we all get taught this at, at college, um, what happened was that uh, lots of us moved up to Northern Europe survived off dairy and it was in our interest to um, keep the lactase enzyme going in our gut. So genetically, those people um, thrived in the winter. So obviously they passed their genes on and, um, and more people in, in Northern Europe, uh, particularly sort of Scandinavian descent can, can digest dairy better than those from let's say East Asia. That's, that's the sort of most um, uh, common area where you, you have this lactose intolerance. So that's primary lactose intolerance. You're basically just not producing that enzyme anymore. Um, the secondary lactose intolerance is when something's going on in that gut. Because they were on the brush border, if, that, uh, if, if somebody's been ill, if they've had like a, a, a 
uh, norovirus or something and they come to you and they're telling you you've got constant diarrhea or have the norovirus or whatever it is start thinking about this maybe they're not tolerating the dairy anymore because that gut needs to be healed up and um, yeah, they might be coming to you with IBS. You've also got to think of celiacs, uh, particularly um, if they've been exposed to gluten because it's done so much damage to those brush borders, they're not going to have those, um, those, those lactase enzymes there. Um, so they, they might be able to tolerate uh, the dairy again once all the gut has been healed up. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of celiacs can tolerate dairy, although a lot can't as well. So moving on, we um, need to think about why people are getting symptoms from lactose intolerance. So the most obvious ones are um, pain, bloating again, excessive um, farting and also diarrhea. Now, where this is different to the other things, it's, it's usually... 30 minutes to two hours after consuming the lactose containing food. The most um, easy example I can give you is of a client who used to get diarrhea as soon as she got to work. And actually, again, taking a case history, she would have a very milky um, latte on the way into work. Um, and actually, you know, she needed a lot of gut repair um, to happen. And then she, I mean, she doesn't have lattes anymore but she can tolerate dairy now but it was just too much and what's happening is that undigested milk sugar basically gets down to the bowel and you get this osmotic diarrhea because you've got this imbalance with the with the uh, the fluids in the bowel which is why it's just it's quite an urgent um uh, diarrhea that one so yeah you can tolerate up to i think it's 25 grams of um of lactose when you when you take it in so if somebody has a little bit of it it's it's okay it's not like um with celiacs where you've totally totally got to avoid um gluten um if there's a little bit in there it's not going to um really cause the damage that the gluten does in in the same way if that makes sense so I'm just going to zo zoom in on some of the digestive enzymes in our um, uh, phytozyme formula. Um, well, these are all the digestive enzymes in there, sorry, not some of them, um, because I've just taken this from the technical sheet. And if you if you want a copy of it, do just email for it, because, again, I, I, it was just helpful to show you what some of the symptoms are. So first of all, amylase, which uh, we'll talk about the source in a minute, is, is my, it's a bit sourced from um, microbes, not from animals, basically, or all these um, enzymes. So really what I want to draw your attention to is this maldigestion of carbohydrates can lead to chronic GI symptoms such as cramping, abdominal distension and diarrhea. Now, quite often you'll get someone coming in and they'll say every time I eat pasta or I eat bread, I get this abdominal distension and immediately we go to, oh my goodness, gluten intolerance. It could just be, if you're thinking about it, it could just be that we've got to support that pancreas. Obviously, usually they're eating way too much wheat anyway and you need to vary their diet more. But sometimes once you've done the work on the gut, you'll often see people that come in and say, oh, I, I had a piece of bread the other day and it was okay. I seem to be tolerating gluten better, but actually it's they're tolerating those starches better. Um, so yeah, and then the glucoamylase, same thing really, um, difficulty digesting the dietary starches. So, so putting those in there to start with, and obviously cleaning up the diet massively um, is, is a good place to start. So more of the enzymes. So we got the protease and I just want to, I'm going to talk about this in a minute related to um, allergies, but just sort of thinking about, um, you know, it's, it's we've gone with going back to this indication here, this low stomach acid, going back to that um, and protein maldigestion, which we talked about already and um, signs and symptoms here of this of this low stomach acid. Um, and uh, yeah, so so the putting the protease in there is going to really assist breaking down these um, these proteins and if let's have a look this effective pH range is 2.75 to 6.25 so even um, effective in that in a slightly higher 
uh, pH sort of um, obviously in an ideal stomach below the stomach in the duodenum. But for most people, if you go back to that stomach acid, um, it's, it's usually not as acidic as we'd like it to be. Then lactase, we've talked about that. I've talked about all of these uh, digestive complaints, so I'll just skip on to cellulase. So this is in there because this basically helps break down dietary fiber. So if someone comes in and they um, fart because they're eating loads and loads of really fibrous food, um, this, this is a helpful uh, enzyme to put in there to, um, to support them digesting that, that high fiber diet. Also very useful if you're starting to introduce a lot more vegetables in their diet. Um, if you introduce a digestive enzyme as well, which includes the cellulase to help them break that down. Um, and likewise, the invitase, uh, which again is found in the, in the small intestine, um, actually helps break down the trisaccharide raffinose, which is found in beans, cabbage, uh, broccoli, and, um, and also whole grains. So again, if, uh, if you've got somebody who can't um, digest the lentils and things and the cabbage and all these lovely healthy things you're trying to get them to eat, um, you know, that the invitase is in there to help them break those things down and have a bit of a smoother digestion, keep them going on your dietary changes, which are ultimately the most important thing that we can be doing. Um, and lipase, of course, uh, which helps to break down fats along with the bile. It works together with the bile. Now, interestingly as well, so this is, again, it's from, um, it's not from animal sources and it's actually microbial derived, but just uh, there's this last line here on the bottom right saying studies have also shown that they are actually equally or more effective than the pancreatin. Um, and at lower doses, which is good to hear, isn't it? Because obviously, you know, you, you have to think about these things as a practitioner, which one to use. We have actually got research that these uh, microbial derived enzymes are effective, uh, uh, if not more effective. So let's just think about, um, again, so breaking down these proteins and food sensitivities and intolerances. And um, basically, if you're putting in these proteolytic enzymes with their meals, it's going to help them break down those dietary proteins. So they're going to be in those smaller chains, which means those bigger antigenic macromolecules aren't going to get into the gut and get into the system if there's leaky gut as well. So you're, you're starting to work on that aspect of why someone's coming to you with these allergies. And um, also, so you've got that point, which is the second point, but the third point there is that actually when these enzymes get into the system through the gut, um, they actually also help with systemic inflammatory um, and allergenic responses as well. So just a quick note really on the microbial derived enzymes, I just mentioned it. Uh, so the advantages over using animal derived enzymes, are there's a couple of uh, really interesting things. One is that they've got a broader range of stability, including getting through the low pH of the stomach if they have low pH of the stomach. Um, and then the second thing is because they're stable, you don't have to put um, such a strong coating, this polymeric coating that get put on these animal derived enzymes which means that you know that basically with that coating, you, the coating's then got to break down in the small intestine. So with something that's, that's not coated like that, it's going to break down more easily. You're going to give the same dose every single time and not sort of leave it to chance that maybe sometimes the coating's not going to break down so well. And as I mentioned already, um, looking at the lipase, there's actually a really good potency at a lower dose, um, which is, again, really useful, isn't it? We don't want to um, be giving massive doses of things, really. So I just I already mentioned about uh, proteolytic enzymes um, helping with inflammation outside the gut but I just wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit in that again this type of person with allergies coming to you and while you're doing these tests they often have things like rhinitis and sinusitis and the enzymes actually help to thin those mucus secretions help to break up the immune complexes and are anti-inflammatory so think again more that sort of systemic aspect of putting in some digestive enzymes 
and also can help with that TH1, TH2 um, balance as well. So I'm not going to talk about that because I, I sort of feel like we covered that's in the other we covered that a bit didn't we um but this oh no sorry um yeah this was quite interesting that the the lactase derived from um from the aspergillus orzai is basically being studied to uh, help with lactose intolerance if if it's given at the same time as milk um obviously i mean as a nutritional therapist we wouldn't be giving them milk anyway but let's say i don't know somebody's going to a wedding and they're really concerned you can send them off with their digestive enzymes um and say it's all right because you know just just double up your dose on this and and, and you'll be able to tolerate whatever it is the cheesecake or whatever that they're having um so yeah invitees we talked about already just a little note, I think, because we get asked this a lot about what about the body, body being able to make these enzymes if you're putting in enzymes, um, which is often something that, that we think about, uh, get asked about um, this theory that the body becomes reliant on the enzyme supplements. And actually, um, just to, to reassure ourselves that we do have these amazing feedback mechanisms in the body. It's such an incredible, sorry, the dog barking outside the window, it's not mine. Um, and the actual enzyme production will shift to meet the digestive requirements. Obviously for you, you're probably gonna be having to do some healing for the, for the pancreas and, and things as well to help uh, with that too. Um, but uh, there is also this, this uh, theory that you get the sparing effect, that if you're supporting it by putting supplements in and keeping you know, th those supplements you're putting in are, are gonna be then part of that circulation, um, it might actually help to support the organ uh, healing as, as you're doing the work that you're doing with them. So supporting that pancreas, so you're gonna put the digestive enzymes in obviously um, with their meals and with bigger meals, you might need to give them to. Again, I think it's just working as a team with your client to see uh, what works best, but generally, um, you know, maybe one with breakfast, two with a larger meal. And obviously alcohol is not a good thing um, to be having in high doses when there's pancreas issues. Um, as most of you know, pancreatitis is uh, something that happens to alcoholics. They get this inflamed pancreas um, and it's very, very serious. Um, so yeah, think about that pancreas. It's, it's not gonna be helped by heavy use of alcohol. So, you know, obviously going back to um, maybe a, a couple of glasses of wine rather than a bottle of wine, um, bringing down the inflammation in the diet, which is, you know, the wonderful work that you will do. Thinking about those gentle foods that you know about for digestion, you know, getting them to pre-soak their almonds if they're gonna use them. Gently steaming food rather than having raw food, especially if, you've, if they're seeing a lot of um, food in the stall at this beginning stage um, you know a little bit of fermented food you know all of this stuff I don't need to tell you but yeah just nice gentle foods as you start to introduce this this pancreatic support with a digestive enzyme 100% address the stress all the way through this really you know if those juices aren't flowing um, uh, you know it's you've got to get on top of why they're not flowing and um, also alongside those digestive enzymes, you might want to think about curcumin. There's some interesting research um, on PubMed. It's not only anti-inflammatory for the pancreas, but also has been found to re reduce injury in the pancreas. So again, if you're thinking about someone who um, has had a high sugar diet, you know, highly processed foods, maybe lots of alcohol, like lots and lots of sign that the pancreas needs support, curcumin would be a good thing to be using alongside those digestive enzymes and along with the lovely dietary changes that you're doing with your nutritional therapy. Okay, so we've got time to chat about the liver um, because I'm actually just going to focus on bile. Um, because we're talking about juices. So we know all the other amazing things that liver does, but bile is not a very sexy subject, but it's actually so important. And actually it's key. I think, I think if you can get on top of someone producing healthy bile, you know, that is what cleans up the small intestine. So if someone is coming to you with um, a, a imbalance of bacteria in their small intestine, 
think about their bile because their body is going to clean itself up. That's what it's designed to do. Um, so yeah, those biles emulsify the fats. Um, they help the lipase digest the fats, absorb our, our fat soluble vitamins. Also bile makes calcium and iron more absorbable. Um, it's really important for the microbiome, um, really important for both lipid and carbohydrate metabolism, um, insulin sensitivity, and also the immune system. So very important. It also, and again, this is key, um, it, it influences gastrointestinal motility. So again, by supporting bile flow, um, you're then supporting the motility and improving intestinal permeability without having to chuck a whole load of things in you know, maybe a place to start is thinking about the bile. We do have a liver bile acid microbiota axis, if you didn't know already. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically they're the link between uh, the hepatic and the intestinal metabolism. Of course they are because they come from the liver into the gut. Um, the microbiota actually regulate bile acid production and signaling. Um, there's some enzymes uh, that uh, from the bacteria that do that. And likewise, the bile acids modulate the microbiota composition, um, which in turn regulates the size and composition of the actual bile acid pool. And yeah, if this, if this good old chit chat isn't happening, there's going to be more inflammation going on. And then this, this, uh, you know, this dysbiosis going on. So this, um, just very briefly, this is taken from that, that paper at the bottom there, bile acid microbiota crosstalk in gastrointestinal inflammation and carcinogenesis. Um, and at the top here, if you just follow my little mouse, you've got a hepatocyte. Um, and in there, you've got cholesterol. Remember that cholesterol is a very important thing, um, which makes our bile acids. And those bile acids, uh, which is the BA here, they then um, squeegee out uh, past the, um, you know, the squeegeed from the, the gallbladder where they've been stored into this intestinal lumen here. And really why I've put this here is because I just quite like that you li it listed all the different types of bacteria that help to deconjugate and metabolize and do all of the things that they're doing to support the bile acids. So you've got this kind of chat going on there. Um, including your lactobacillus and your bifido, uh, which obviously most of us uh, know very well. And then, yeah, if they're unconjugated, they go back through the intestinal lumen and they up the portal vein back into the liver for a bit of recycling. So again, lots of similar um, symptoms for impaired liver function, undigested food in the stool, constipation, um, bile is key for, for keeping the, the poo nice and uh, easy to pass, uh, feeling sick and not tolerating fatty foods. Um, so what we want to think about is stimulating that bile, improving the solubility of bile because most people have this biliary stasis, um, this kind of sticky thick bile, um, which can then um, form kind of sludgy bile in the gallbladder and, and also um, for some people form gallstones as well. So we want to support all of that side of bile flow, get it flowing nicely and supporting uh, digestion. So we do this using lipotrophic nutrients. Um, so these are the nutrients in ultralive, taurine, choline, methionine, and inositol, and they support healthy fat metabolism and promote bile flow. Um, and I mean, a lot of you know that choline is pretty low in a lot of diets, particularly uh, vegan diets. Um, and uh, that can actually lead to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is starting to be discovered as, as you know, um, uh, veganism has gone more mainstream, this, this link between low choline and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, B vitamins as well, these are, these are in the ultralive B6, 9 and 12, because obviously, as you all know, they're going to help with liver detox, um, but also uh, help with the metabolism of the fats and carbohydrates and synthesize the fatty acids, which are gonna help obviously make the cholesterol and make the, the bile acids. Milk thistle um, is a very, very traditionally used herb for the liver and I strongly recommend it. Again, this is in the ultralive formula and it is going to really, really help basically uh, uh, not only with the bile flow, but also supporting the actual gallbladder function. 
so it increases the solubility of bile and uh, bile and helps with healthy gallbladder function and yeah we've got these lovely active constituents uh two of them being silymarin and silybin which protect the liver cells restore the liver cells so again thinking about we looked at that diagram the bile is made in those liver cells and so we need them to be nice and healthy um, it's also anti-inflammatory and antioxidant and um, again, if you've got somebody presenting with raised uh, liver enzymes um, in NAFLD, it's going to really help support that. So very, very useful for, for fatty liver. Dandelion, another ingredient in the uh, Ultralive, which is wonderful because, again, it supports the liver and the bile function. Uh, very detoxifying as well as being a pancreatic regulator, which is very useful, but lots of traditional use, the same as um, milk thistle, and now loads and loads of lovely studies showing why. Um, so uh, this is one that you've got to be careful if somebody's got a blocked bile duct with um, kidney stones because it's so powerful at stimulating um, the flow of bile. Um, so there is a bit, a bit of a caution there with, with dandelion. Other things to think about, to think about supporting bile is curcumin. Again, loads of really interesting research um, around this, uh, particularly if somebody's got very sort of sludgy bile sitting in the gallbladder, um, it helps the gallbladder contract. And um, it, uh, I think that study, the Rasid and Lilo one, it's something like 50% or something, 50% better um, kind of squeegeeing of the gallbladder um, with the curcumin in there and quite a small dose as well not massive doesn't have to be massive doses and the other really helpful thing is vitamin c uh, which helps uh, convert the cholesterol to the bile salts um, as we saw in that diagram in in the um, in the hepatic cells but also it's related to um, uh, gallstones if, if somebody's got low vitamin c they're at higher risk of gallstones so you know bear in mind that vitamin c is is also very very important for digestion and then you've got your bitter foods um, and your liver supporting foods which again you all know but just a reminder of, of some of them Sometimes it might be useful to get somebody just to have a little tiny bowl of rocket and radish and endive or something with just a little bit of apple cider vinegar on um, just to stimulate those digestive juices. Um, yeah, compliance on that one can be quite hard. So the other thing is hot water with um, grated ginger in there and a little bit of lemon again, just to kind of stimulate some of these juices. So this is a lovely chart, um, just talking about herbs again that, that support um, IBS. And this is taken from one of our IBS tech sheets. Um, so we just kind of wanted to show you some of the resources that I have there for you that I can just email you or post you. Um, but these are all the herbs in the IB Pro. So really, really useful when there's a lot going on in the gut and you suspect that the juices aren't flowing and they're stressed and they're kind of like stomach is all tied up in knots and the anxious is going to help with quite a lot of different things. So a lot of the symptoms that we've been talking about from a, a, a less than perfect functioning of stomach uh, liver and pancreas, things like chamomile is going to help with the, the farting, the diarrhea and stomach cramping and bloating and inflammation. And then the lemon balm is also going to help with the bloating and the nausea. Um, and also um, the globe artichoke is, as I mentioned earlier, I think a mild, um, mild bitter. So again, it's, it's going to sort of help with the juices there. Um, and that feeling of fullness that uh, people talk about. Then you've got fennel in there, which is lovely uh, digestive herb and caraway as well. So those are both used quite traditionally in, in um, sort of Ayurveda, aren't they? Fennel and caraway. So very briefly, just to um, run through the products I've mentioned today, just to recap, I've talked about peptides, which is for, um, uh, like um, acid reflux and things like that. Um, I'm just going to signpost you to an actual talk done by um, Sam on that, which is really useful resource on, on the website. But yeah, that's Peptes, which has got the deglycerized licorice, some zinc and some meadow sweet in there. We've got the lovely IV Pro, um, which you can give with each meal um, just to kind of help normalize bowel function, get the juices going, get that stress out of the gut. Curcumin, we've got the Curcuforte as the Curcumin C3. 
phytozyme, which is those lovely digestive enzymes that, that we went through in detail. Ultralive, uh, where I talked about the milk thistle, uh, dandelion, the lipotrophics in there and the B vitamins. And then we've got some vitamin C formulas, uh, the wonderful C-Max, uh, which is a lovely vitamin C powder, um, as well as the C-Caps if, if people don't like the powders. And just to say, if you want uh, some of the charts and technical sheets, please do, you can find them on the website, but please do email me. That's, that's what I'm here for. Um, and just to give you an example, this is the chart for um, IBS. I know you can't read this very clearly, but just to show you, it kind of helps you um, organize your thinking and the reason I've put this one here is again it's got those signs so impaired liver function up here the top right look for signs of undigested food constipation nausea fatty food intolerance and then what you might use the ultra live the curcumin um, so so it's sort of a really nice sort of signposting tool um, for you and a bit of a summary of quite a lot of what we talked about today and this is just the lunch and learn I mentioned again I can just email you this link um, and Sam just kind of goes through uh, the um, pathophys of uh, upper gastrointestinal tract conditions um, and again how you're going to kind of heal up that gut. We are going to talk about this more in the next session as well but uh, obviously I can't cover everything um, but that is that is definitely worth watching thinking about symptom management through practical dietary and lifestyle measures um, and thinking about functional eating, food combining and stress management in much more detail. So thank you very much for having me. I've slightly whizzed through that in uh, 50 minutes, I think, um, which wasn't uh, too bad. Sorry, I hope that wasn't too... Um, Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Lucy, Lucy, I know you're, you're, um, you haven't got a huge amount of time. So... Um, yeah. What you could do is, do you want to email me any of the links and then we can circulate that to the practitioners rather than you getting yeah. lots and lots and lots of individual emails? Um, uh, yeah, so I can just see got, some Yeah, I've got some questions as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, Diego, having nausea after hydrochloric acid supplementation, um i i think yeah that's a tricky one we don't we don't actually have um an hcl uh product so i i'm it's, it's kind of like a bit of a funny line because i can't really talk about it under the cover of biomedica but um as a practitioner <laughs> um i would i would definitely take that out and try other other methods um and try and get to the bottom of that um perhaps using the company that that's provided that hydrochloric acid supplement to go through what what might have happened there um sorry that's a bit of a flaky response um but i think i think just really want to highlight the importance of using practitioner support of these supplement companies um and that is such a good way to to learn more and yeah, gallbladder removed is, is an interesting one, um, Sandra, because you've just got to think about the fact that the gallbladder is just not storing things. So the bile is just dripping in. Um, so it is, it is still working. The bile is still flowing into the gut and you still want to be supporting that bile flow. But again, um, oh, yeah, do you, did you want to answer Diego's question? It says you wanted to answer that live. No. Oops, sorry. No? Okay. Ignore me. That's me trying to, okay. to move it and then I've just oh, okay. pressed the wrong yeah, button. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Sandra, I think, I think again, depending on the, to how messed up their digestion is at that stage, you have to, um, I would go in gently with what you're thinking of doing and, and just monitor symptoms and see how they're going. Um, but if there's, if there's specific things you want to use, there's quite a few things I get asked um, for the technical team about um, gallbladder removed and, and usually things are pretty safe to use but it's always worth checking uh, and using the resources that you have um, you're not all on your own you know you have got these resources here and, and do ask um, okay so yeah Diego I mean I think that's sort of difficult if they've had um, if they've had the gallbladder removed they are going to be more likely um to have overgrowth of bacteria in that small intestine so if you can be supporting the digestive enzymes to help clear everything up supporting the bile flow supporting the stomach acid those are quite basic things to be 
supporting to help keep that um, the bacteria in check and definitely fiber obviously um, I would be thinking about putting some fiber in there so we have the GI restore which has got a couple of FODMAPs approved fibers in um, just to kind of keep things moving through that small intestine so they're not just sitting there um, it, it's pretty much a good idea um, Sandra, why would milk this will make someone sick or have adverse effects? I guess I'd need to know a bit more about that particular case. It might be um, that their liver is really toxic. Um, it, I, I think you'd have to email me with that case and, and we'd run through that um, and, and work it out. Um, but again, sometimes it's a question of starting with a much lower dose. Um, and, you know, if, if somebody's system is, is really struggling and, uh, you know, working more with foods to support the liver, all of that kind of thing, and doing all the nutritional support uh, before the supplementary support. Um, so... Yeah, heartburn with ginger. I think you've got to think more about that imbalance of the of the, the acids in the stomach, um, and you know the ginger sort of getting things going, and and that you've you've got lots of work to do basically to yeah, go with that person if they're getting heartburn with ginger. Um, it could be that the stomach acid is has been really low or really high. I mean, again, I, I'd have to. I'd have to find out more about that case. Um, but again, if, if that, that person, I'd probably go in with something like peptides, soothe that gut down and work out what else is going on to cause that heartburn. Um, and yes, Susie, I can send you the presentation if you really want to. Because it's more information on the technical sheets, which is far more superior, uh, which I can send you, um, no problem. Yes, yeah, Sandra, find out more and, and just email me and we can run through that case. And um, I think I think that's that, isn't it? That's it did, yeah. did you have any comments on on any of those questions? Um, no, I mean I think I think they're all really good good answers. And I think um, I mean I we, we talk about bile a lot, don't we, Lucy? Um, so Ultra Live is probably my number one favorite supplement ever. Um, and I think I mean I think certainly for me, I think it's just a really really good way of thinking back to the basics of digestion, which so many of us just forget we get carried away with you know the stuff that we can do rather than just getting the foundations right which is just brilliant um what i will say to everyone is that every couple of weeks we have a, a really informal zoom session um where you can just turn up ask us some questions it can be about the kbmo test, tests uh, the new panel um, and any cases that you might want to talk through, any labs you might have questions about. Um, and I'll be there with Claire. And it's usually every other Friday. So keep a lookout in your um, uh, the newsletters that are sent out, usually on a Tuesday, and you'll get all the information in there. But if you do have any other questions from today, we could go over those in that particular session or um, wait until Lucy's back, which is only a couple of weeks, isn't it? So we'll we'll look forward to um, seeing part two where we're looking at the gastrointestinal oh, mucin, my other favourite subject. Exciting, exciting. We need to get out more, I think. Um, but I just I know Lucy it has to go. So uh -huh. really, just thank you for having me. Us. Thank you so much, Lucy. It's been really helpful, um, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you, Lucy. Bye. And just to everyone else, if you do have any questions about today, please come back um, to me or Claire. Um, and we'll be happy to help, um, especially if you have any questions or queries about the new uh, panel that we have on the gut barrier. Thank you very much.